welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocha, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Welcome to the latest edition of our Arbitral Insights podcast series. I'm delighted to have Earl Rivera Dolera as our guest today. Good afternoon, Earl. It is a real pleasure to be chatting with you today. Hi, Joyce. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. For the benefit of our listeners, Earl is the head of international arbitration at Fraser's Law Company in Vietnam. She is qualified to practice in New York, England and Wales, and the Philippines. She currently practices in Vietnam as a foreign lawyer. Earl is highly experienced in international arbitration. In over a decade of practice, she has acted in various capacities as arbitrator, counsel, tribunal secretary, and expert in arbitration seated across the globe. Earl, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. I'm really excited to learn more about international arbitration in Vietnam from you today. To set some context for our listeners, Vietnam recently announced its Power Development Plan, PDP-8, which sets out Vietnam's energy strategy up to 2030. This is part of the wider aim of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. PDP-8 will require a significant amount of investments, almost $135 billion, to reach its 2030 goals. When foreign investors are considering investment opportunities, a key concern is to ensure that minimum standards of fairness and justice will apply if any disputes arise. This often leads parties to agree to arbitrate in a neutral venue. Venues such as Singapore and the UK tend to be popular because they are seen to be neutral and to have a stable and arbitration-friendly legal ecosystem. Singapore or English law also tend to be favoured as governing laws because there is a rich body of case law precedent. Oh, is this a trend which you are seeing for investments into Vietnam or joint ventures involving projects in Vietnam? Thanks very much for that. Great question, Joyce. You know, previously, we would usually see arbitration clauses or the preference of clients for Singapore's seat and the governing law would be Vietnamese law. But now we also see further queries, um, increasing queries for Vietnam to be the seat and Vietnam law to be the governing law under the VIAC rules. Um, It's not going to be a, a... a a heavy shift altogether towards Vietnam, towards domestic arbitration, but we see increasing queries on this one, largely because of the ease of enforcement of domestic arbitral awards. And just to uh, highlight this point, in domestic arbitrations, there is one step only in the enforcement of domestic arbitral awards. There's no need to go to Vietnamese courts to have your arbitration award recognized. So we go directly to the enforcement agency, which is a state government agency, uh, for the enforcement of the domestic award. As opposed to foreign arbitral awards, which is equivalent to international arbitration awards, as what you might have in Singapore, there are two steps for the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. First, we have to petition the Vietnamese courts for recognition. And then second would be the enforcement in the enforcement agency. So largely because of the ease of enforcement that we see increasing queries for VIAC, Vietnam Law Governed, and Vietnam Seat Arbitrations. That is really interesting. So based on what you have just described, is it fair to say that if I have an award issued by a Vietnam seated tribunal in an arbitration administered by the VIAC, which is the Vietnam International Arbitration Center, in respect of a Vietnam law governed contract, this award is likely to be enforced in the same manner as a court judgment issued by a Vietnamese court? Yes, very much so. Under the VIAC, un- Arbitrations administered by VAAC, governed by Vietnam law, um, with seat in Vietnam, the 
enforcement is way much easier than when we have foreign arbitral awards arising from Singapore seat or Hong Kong seat arbitrations. But I think this is the, the, the biggest advantage for VIAC, Vietnam law governed arbitrations. We could go deep dive and, and discuss as well what might be the disadvantages on that side. So I'm, I'm only highlighting the largest, biggest advantage for VIAC, Vietnam law governed arbitrations. It's really the ease of enforcement. Absolutely. And of course, enforcement is extremely important because there is, as, as we all know, there is no point having an award in your favor if you can't enforce it. It's a meaningless piece of paper. Couldn't agree more on that. Exactly. So there seems to be several components to this winning formula involving choice of seat, arbitral institution, and governing law. So perhaps it would be helpful if we explore these individually. First off, if parties are happy to nominate Vietnam as the forum for resolving disputes, why might they choose arbitration over litigation? Largely because of a number of reasons. First, of course, is as what we would expect in major hubs for arbitration. It's the party's free and voluntary choice of arbitrators. Arguably, it's also faster um, than what we might have in litigations. And more so when we compare VIAC arbitrations and uh, Vietnamese court litigation. So arguably, it's really faster when we go through VIAC arbitrations as compared to Vietnamese court litigation. Of course, it, we, there are exceptions, and we could dwell on that and discuss that uh, later on. As well, uh, in VIAC arbitrations, um, in arbitrations in Vietnam, we could choose the language of arbitration. When we go to Vietnamese court litigation, we have no choice but to litigate in Vietnamese. There's also this huge advantage in arbitration, the availability of other reliefs that might not be available in Vietnamese court litigations. One would be an example that, uh, you know, off the top of my head is the loss of profits claim, clear enforceability perhaps of liquidated damages clause, which might not be available in Vietnamese court litigation. Um, but of course, I say this with a caveat that um, the availability of these reliefs might be available, of course, in the course of the arbitral procedure. But if we get an arbitral award and the enforcement of these reliefs might be put into question when we go to Vietnam courts. Understood. Okay. And why might parties prefer to have their arbitration seated in Vietnam over, say, Singapore or Hong Kong or London? Great question, Joyce. First huge advantage, uh, in addition to what was earlier mentioned about the ease of enforcement, it's the way, way, way cheaper cost of arbitration in VIAC, under the VIAC rules, Vietnam seat, Vietnam law governed. And just to give you an example, for, for example, a $1 million claim in ICC or SIAC arbitrations seated in Singapore or Hong Kong, that might you know, uh, um, you know, the cost of arbitration might go as high as, let's say, hundred thousand U.S. dollars or three hundred thousand U.S. dollars if you have a three-member tribunal. For VIAC arbitrations, the cost of arbitration could just be as low as twenty thousand U.S. dollars to about forty thousand U.S. dollars. So that's one huge, huge advantage of VIAC arbitrations, Vietnam seated arbitrations. And of course, if I may add as well and, and highlight again, it's the, the ease of enforcement of these VIAC arbitrations in Vietnam. No, There's no need for domestic arbitration awards to be recognized by the VIAC courts. We go straight to the enforcement agencies. You made a very compelling case for um, choosing Vietnam as an arbitration seat, though. So if you know other our listeners are convinced, like me, maybe, to nominate Vietnam as a seat for arbitration, what should foreign parties be mindful of? Now we go to 
what might be perceived as disadvantages, Joyce, uh, because whenever clients come to us and, and want to discuss what might be the pros and cons between foreign uh, versus domestic arbitrations, we highlight to them, of course, the huge advantages and, of course, the disadvantages as well. And, and we would want parties, especially foreign investors, to be mindful of each of these advantages and not um, forgetting the disadvantages as well. First off, from the ease of enforcement and the cheaper cost of arbitration that, is, that we discussed earlier as the main advantages and the major selling points of VIAC and Vietnam seated arbitrations, these, these had to be balanced out. What would be the priority of the client? This would have to be balanced out with the vastly different arbitral procedure in VIAC arbitrations as compared to what you might have, um, what you have in SIAC or ICC arbitrations, LCIA arbitrations seated in Singapore. Um, the arbitral procedure under VIAC rules is largely civil law based. It's quite direct and straightforward, not much um, reliance on witness statements and expert reports. So when we go to the hearing, parties would have to be would have to expect that sometimes not all witnesses would be called, not all experts would be called by the tribunal members. And you know for no reason at all, it's just the way uh, the VAC rules are worded. Not much reliance by the tribunal in their preparation of the arbitral awards and witness statements and expert reports. A second thing that would need to be balanced out is that under the law on commercial arbitration in Vietnam, there's no express immunity from suit for arbitrators in their capacity of acting out um, duties and responsibilities in arbitrations. So we see quite a trend of arbitrators being sued in Vietnam courts when they issue orders that were not expressly provided for under the law on commercial arbitration. And because these arbitrators are being sued in court uh, and they are not being paid as much as what we would expect in SIAC, ICC, LCIA arbitrations, most of these arbitrators just resign or withdraw from the cases. And that could, of course, potentially if not, you know, um, you know, highly delay the arbitral procedures more and more. So, as you know, we could loop this back in our earlier discussion, where it's faster. Arbitrations could be faster than litigation in Vietnam, but if the parties would go by this route of suing arbitrators in Vietnam, it could unnecessarily delay the arbitral procedure. And lastly, there are no clear powers of arbitrators in Vietnam to issue or impose interim relief. And that's why arbitrators issuing orders for interim relief under, let's say, ICC rules, SIAC rules, um, they are being sued in Vietnam. And let me not forget the lack of predictability as well. As you know, Joyce, in, in common law jurisdictions, you have robust case authorities to guide um, arbitrators, to guide parties in the conduct of arbitral procedure or arbitral proceedings. But Vietnam being a civil law jurisdiction, we do not have a robust body of case authorities or case guidelines that would guide arbitrators in the preparation of the award, in the conduct of the arbitral procedure, or guide parties altogether in the way we plead our case or we plead or make submissions in the course of the arbitral procedure. So that's also one downside, the lack of predictability. That's really helpful to hear, Earl. And as you say, it's um, for the parties to balance their various priorities, but it's helpful for them to know in advance of entering into the contract what the advantages and disadvantages are so that they can balance, you know, based on the, the situation of their contract, what they want to get out of their contracts. You mentioned earlier the lack of robust um, body of case authority, and that leads us very nicely to my next question. So 
do you often see arbitration agreements which provide for Vietnam seats administered by VIAC? But, you know, maybe the parties are not comfortable having the contract governed by Vietnam law, so they nominate English law or Singapore law instead? Yes, very much. There are queries on, on this iteration of the arbitration clause, Joyce. But it could be still arguable when we reach Vietnam courts for recognition and enforcement that such an arbitration clause would result to the arbitration award being determined or being deemed as a foreign arbitration award. So that's that's still an arguable case. That's a tricky area to tread. Um, when we reach the Vietnam courts for petitions for recognition of the arbitral award, even if the contract is governed by Singapore law or English law, Vietnam courts tend to view the arbitration award, tend to still review the arbitration award on the merits. That's still been the trend. And there might not be any change in the near foreseeable future on that trend by the Vietnamese courts reviewing arbitration awards on the merits. And when they review the merits of the arbitration awards, they view it from the lens of Vietnamese law. So if, if a Singapore law governed contract or arbitration or English law governed arbitration and the foreign and the arbitration award resulted to, let's say, the granting of liquidated damages clause or loss of profits. And under Vietnamese law, liquidated damages or loss of profits may not be a governed or regulated relief. So Vietnamese courts might construe this as granting of relief that runs in violation or not in compliance with Vietnamese law. And Vietnamese courts might tend to or might be inclined to set aside or reject this part of the relief or altogether the whole arbitration award. So that's one thing to consider. That makes sense. And you know, as you say, if it's preferable for Vietnam law to be the governing law, is there anything else that foreign investors should be mindful of? If you've discussed liquidated damages, the lack of a robust body of case authority, are there any other features that someone contemplating whether to um, to nominate Vietnam law as a governing law should be aware of? For sure, for sure. Vietnamese law is a civil law jurisdiction, um, and it's governed by strict interpretation of its legal and regulatory framework. So foreign investors or clients coming and investing into Vietnam would have to be mindful of that in the first place. So we've seen quite a number of disputes coming to us where their documentation was so messy. They relied on, let's say, templates from Google. They relied on chat GPT to save on legal costs when preparing um, their transactional documents. And then now they come to us because they're disputing with their, con- with their counterparties. And of course, our first question, who prepared all these documents? Who prepared all your contracts? We do not, of course, uh, you know, advocate that all contracts must be perfect, must be, you know, with all the flowery words. But we advocate, of course, that from the preparation of the contract, it should be, it should be. And we cannot underestimate this recommendation. It should be reviewed by Vietnamese legal counsel. One thing that we would want parties to be mindful of is that the proper way of contracting in Vietnam is vastly different from what you might have in Singapore. Let me give you an example. A contract that is unsigned in Singapore, governed by Singapore law, is considered a valid contract so long as there might be an exchange of emails where the counterparty agreed, and even if it's not signed at all, even if it's just an okay or an emoji, I think there's one recent case authority where an emoji, a thumbs up emoji. Yes, in um, Canada. Yes, in Canada, that's true. Uh, just, you know, and, and a thumbs up emoji was considered as an agreement to the contract. 
there was no signed contract at all. And under Singapore law or can Canada law, that's proper contracting. And, and so long as the parties continued to perform their obligation or com even just commence to perform their obligations under that unsigned contract. But under Vietnam law, it's highly arguable that an unsigned contract is not a valid contract at all. So even if you performed your obligations in the contract, but if it's not signed, or even if signed but not by the proper authorized signatory, then that could still be invalidated by Vietnamese courts. So we really have to be careful from the very get-go, from the very start, when you transact into business in, with Vietnamese counterparties. So that's one thing to be mindful of. Just, just do not, just avoid Googling templates for your contracts with a Vietnam component. Or not to use WhatsApp agreements, you know? Put everything in proper contract form, properly sealed, properly signed in wet ink. It's still arguable where docu signs or electronic signature is valid in Vietnam. So we might as well just go by the conservative route and do wet ink signatures. Absolutely. And I think you've given us quite a few very helpful takeaway points, Earl. And the key point that arises on what you've just said to us is parties need to be thinking about potential disputes, even when they're signing the contract, right? So it's not just about getting the deal signed. It's about making sure that the contract that is signed or agreed is ultimately enforceable without any issue in Vietnam. That's true. Totally agree with that. So when disputes first arise, Earl, are there measures which foreign parties can seek from the Vietnamese courts in support of arbitration? For example, freezing or anti-suit injunctions? And is there a distinction based on whether the arbitration is seated in Vietnam? Let me go through to my first point. For example, if the arbitration is seated in Singapore or Hong Kong or other common law jurisdictions. Under the law on commercial arbitration in these jurisdictions, in these major hubs for arbitration, of course, arbitrators have the power to issue freezing orders and or anti-suit injunctions. But, but when we, it comes to enforcement, then we go into some obstacles. It might not be enforced in Vietnam. When we go to Vietnamese courts, showing the orders for interim relief issued by Singapore seated arbitrators, it's, it's highly likely that it might not be enforced in Vietnam. But if it's an arbitration seated in Vietnam, there's more probability that the order for interim relief could be enforced by the Vietnamese courts. I see. Vietnam is, of course, a signatory to the New York Convention. So would the Vietnamese courts be minded to recognize and enforce an injunction or interim order issued by a tribunal? And again, is there a distinction depending on whether the arbitration is seated in Vietnam? I wish I could say there's no more distinction. Um, as earlier mentioned, for foreign seated arbitrations, if there would be injunctions, orders for interim relief issued, it would be very difficult to enforce it via the Vietnamese courts. But for arbitration seated in Vietnam, the orders for interim relief issued by arbitrators seated in Vietnam, there's high, higher probability that the Vietnamese courts would tend to enforce those injunctions or interim order or orders for interim relief. Um, but of course, uh, even if Vietnam is a signatory, to the New York Convention, we see these differences in approach in the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, in the approach of the enforcement of orders for interim relief. And it could be argued, you know, that uh, these differences is in violation of the WTO commitments that uh, Vietnam had entered into or had committed to in enforcing foreign arbitration awards, uh, enforcing foreign orders for interim relief without undue delay and without other extra steps and without it becoming more onerous to the parties 
that could still be argued. And, you know, it could go all the way to the WTO if we want to argue this point. Um, but there's light at the end of the tunnel, Joyce. Um, there's an ongoing public consultation at the moment, and it's been going on for the past couple of months. Uh, public consultation for the amendment of the law on commercial arbitration. I think the government is listening to public clamor for amendments to be made on the law on commercial arbitration, especially, especially on the difficulty of um, enforcing foreign arbitration awards in Vietnam. Um, that leads us quite neatly to the next point, which is the enforceability of foreign awards in Vietnam. So I understand that there have been a few recent cases where the Vietnamese courts have refused to enforce SIAC awards. What are common grounds for challenging the recognition and enforcement of foreign awards in Vietnam? We have canvassed um, one of my major duties when I first relocated to Vietnam about almost three years ago was to canvas all the published um, decisions of the Vietnamese courts that rejected the petitions for recognition of foreign arbitral awards. There were about 80 plus judgments that were published. Of course, not all arbitration related court judgments are being published in Vietnam. But for those published, there were about 80 plus court judgments published that are arbitration related. And there were about 33 that were rejected in terms of the petitions for recognition of foreign arbitral awards. There are two major common grounds um, for challenging or in rejecting the uh, recognition, the petition for recognition and enforcement of foreign awards in Vietnam that we've seen in those published court judgments. First, the court would say, there's lack of authority of the signatory of the underlying contract, and therefore the underlying contract was invalid. I would wish to highlight this point because Vietnam law has this principle or concept of legal representative that's written in the enterprise registration certificate. A legal representative in Vietnam in, under the law of enterprises is not a lawyer, not necessarily a lawyer, not necessarily the in-house counsel. A legal representative under the Enterprise Registration Certificate in Vietnam is the person authorized to sign contracts, the person authorized to enter into obligations with other contracting parties on behalf of the entity. So if it, the underlying contract was signed by another person who is not the legal representative registered in the enterprise registration certificate, that contract may run into the danger of being held invalid. The second major common ground that I would like to share with you this afternoon, Joyce, is a lack of proper service of the notice of arbitration and the lack of proper service of the request for arbitration. And this has been commonly cited in, in a number, quite a number of court judgments rejecting the petitions for recognition of foreign arbitral awards. One interesting case that we've seen is there was a lack of proper notice of the discussions as to the appointment of arbitrators. And as you very well know, know Joyce, the discussion as to the appointment of arbitrators is an internal discussion in the arbitral institutions. When, of course, if the parties were unable to decide or to agree on, for example, the chairman or the president of the arbitral tribunal, then the appointing authority would have the discretion to decide or to, to, to determine who the chair or who the president of the arbitral tribunal might be. One court judgment uh, pointed out that the parties, the respondent, especially the award debtor, was not properly notified of the discussions of the, uh, the, the appointment of the chair or the appointment of the president of the arbitral tribunal. So that's a, an interesting point, which will not be a point at all when we have arbitrations in Singapore or Hong Kong. Those are the two things, two major grounds, Joyce. 
Thank you. Well, that's really helpful um, for us to bear in mind, um, obviously, especially when we're planning an arbitration to make sure that we jump through all the procedural hoops so that we don't fall foul of this at the end and when, when we're trying to seek to enforce the award in Vietnam. Final question for you, Earl. If you could have three wishes, what are the three areas in which you hope to see reform in Vietnam arbitration law? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> First off, and I think it's ongoing, it's been ongoing for the past decade or so, but you know, continuous guidance and training, especially for judges. Um, that especially the fact that arbitration is not a threat to the judges. It could even be a potential retirement career. So, you know, in, it, this is quite common in a lot of developing economies that judges may tend to construe arbitration awards as a threat to its jurisdiction and would tend to view arbitration awards with less um, favor as opposed to, let's say, court judgments. That's one thing, more robust and continuing guidance and training for judges. Secondly, available powers. Make it express available power for arbitrators, whether seated in arbitrations overseas or arbitrations in, in Vietnam, for arbitrators to issue orders for interim relief. And lastly, I would want, I would wish very much for expressly provided for immunity from suit for arbitrators seated in Vietnam. Thank you, Earl. Um, you've given us a mine of useful information to think about. It only remains for me to say thank you once again for joining us on this podcast today. It has been, really been insightful, and I'm sure our listeners will have lots to take away from this. Thank you, Earl. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you very much, Reed Smith, for having me in today's podcast. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first-of-its-kind mobile app that forecasts the costs of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, ReadSmith.com, and our social media accounts at ReadSmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.